guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Good evening, Elevate Wednesday night. I get the pleasure of uh, sharing a little bit with Pastor Anthony tonight while Isaac is graduating. Praise the Lord. Champion. We're on a series now that uh, the pastors kicked off called Monsters, Inc. or Mind Monsters. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about that, uh, about the challenges that we face. You know, the Bible says that once we become born again, we go on with the Lord by being transformed by the renewing of our mind. Uh, we are three-part being. We're spirit, soul, and body. We are a spirit. We have a soul, which is our mind, will, and emotions, and we live in a body. And they're all separate, but they're also overlapping, sort of interconnected, so sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference from one to another, like between spirit and soul. But we live out of our spirit, man. Life emanates from us. The Holy Ghost lives inside of us. We're a new creature. We're recreated. Uh, we have... Uh, regeneration by the power of the Holy Spirit in our spirit man and our spirit man has the capacity to receive from heaven to receive from God revelation knowledge and impart it to the soul uh, anybody ever be reading the word or worshiping or something and all of a sudden you sort of feel something bubble up out of your spirit and then all of a sudden it becomes cognitive and you go whoa and you think that's way too intelligent for me to have come up with, right? Because the spirit man is speaking to the soul. The enemy knows that and he doesn't want you to get revelation in the soul because then you can put it into action. And you can activate the body because your soul and your spirit man are in agreement. And so what he tries to do is he tries to get you out of the frequency of heaven to inhibit your ability to connect with your spirit man who's connected to the Lord or to heavenly things. And he'll do that by trying to change your frequency with negativity, uh, with opportunities to become offended or to get involved in things that uh, seduce you out of that frequency. Everything that's in the world vibrates at a frequency that's inconsistent with the heavenly frequency. That's why the natural man can't receive the things of God, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned or they are discerned when we have the capacity to tune in to the heavenly frequency. So what does the enemy do? He puts vain imaginations into our mind to exalt themselves against knowledge of God or connection with the spirit realm so God can give us direction on how to live victorious in this life. Amen? You guys with me so far? So imagine you wake up in the morning, you spend time in the word, you're worshiping, all is well. And then as Pastor Virginia was alluding to the other day, you get on the freeway and you, you, get, you, know, you get the high one. And uh, all of a sudden, there's a you're being challenged to stay in the, in the frequency of your word time, and prayer time. Or to step out of that frequency, to step out of the light and into the darkness. Because the devil can't touch you when you dwell in the light. All he can do is from darkness try to seduce you to come over the line into his territory. Then he has a measure of dominion there. And God is constantly encouraging us and teaching us to stay in the light. Right? Right? The fear of the Lord is one of the ways you stay in the light. Staying humble, stay in the light, right? Speak God's word. Meditate on it day and night. Then and only then when you have good success. Stay in the light. Stay in the light. But you ever see, you know, maybe a bully at school, right? And he's confronting you. He wants to fight. You don't want to fight. But then all of a sudden you get mad. And he goes, and this is so old school. This is like spanking our gang. But they used to like put a chip, knock that off. And they used to go like that and say, cross that line. In other words, if you cross that line, it's on. Well, that's what the devil's doing all the time with us. He's challenging us. Go ahead if you're so tough. If you be the son of God, right? He challenged Jesus. 
cross that line. Come on. Come into the ring with me. Right? In other words, he's saying, step out of the light into my arena and let's see how you do as a believer. And we're over here going, if you want to tangle with me, I'm okay with that. But you cross my line. You come into the light with me and we'll see who ends up standing. Right? So there is a war to pull believers out of the presence of God, out of the spirit, or if you will, out of the frequency of heaven where victory is for us. So as I was meditating on this, I, I got this image, and then I went online and pulled it up. Can we put the, the, the geosphere up? Anybody remember J Jurassic Park? And I was thinking to myself, <clears throat> this is the life of a believer who lives in the world full of monsters who refuses to come out of the light. Now, I realize in the movie that the, the geosphere was compromised by a big monster, but in the spirit realm, right, you are impervious to every monster on the field as long as you stay in your geosphere. I like to call it in the kingdom, it's a biosphere. As long as you abide in the light or in the life of God, you got not, you're a Psalm 91 champion. Do you realize Psalm 91 promises you that the devil can't touch you? And yet we have believers that we're going to the hospital to pray for on a regular basis, right? It is because there's little areas in our life where the devil can still egg us to cross the line into his territory and then we get attacked. So we need to define those areas in our life where we can be compromised, those little mind monsters, and then we need to go to God and we need to address those areas so that whatever it is that he does, we're like, nope, I'm staying in my biosphere. And, you know, these kids don't look scared. They look like they're having a great time, and yet there's some pretty serious beasts running around outside the biosphere, right? This is the Psalm 91 biosphere. And this is where, in a perfect Christianity, we should all be living, but unfortunately, we're all growing in our capacity to live in a bubble, if you will. The atmosphere or the frequency of heaven is on the inside of this bubble, even though all hell is breaking loose on the outside. We're supposed to say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth in my sphere of influence as it is in heaven. Right? That's the way it's supposed to work for us. Most of the torments, in my opinion, in the mind of a believer are due to identity issues. Not knowing who you are in Christ. If we think wrong thoughts about God, we will inadvertently think wrong thoughts about ourselves. And if we think wrong thoughts about ourselves, we will think wrong thoughts about other people. So who God is to you will determine your reality and how people react with you and how you react to people. The devil starts when we're very, very young to try to morph or, or confuse the image of God in us. We have rejection scenarios. We have uh, people with lies. We have movies. Everything is trying to morph who, uh, 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 the reality of who God is so that by the time we want to step up to the plate, we give our lives to Jesus, and then that people are saying, you should do this, you should do that. Like, I can't do that. Well, why not? You're in God. But you've got a history of tapes going on in your head constantly about how big the enemy is and how small God is and how it's impossible and you could never do that and you're too old, you don't have the money, you were born on the wrong side of the tracks, whatever it is, the devil, the mind monsters will capitalize on these little things to try to prevent you from moving forward. You know, I used to surf a lot when I was young. And it wasn't too bad at it either. And uh, I made the terrible mistake of allowing somebody to convince me that I should go see Jaws on the big screen <laughs> when it first came out. It freaked me out, right? Because I spent a lot of time in the water. So I would paddle out into the water after I saw the movie, and every little piece of kelp that rubbed up against my leg was just, oh, my God. Right? And it literally was stealing 
Now, for me, before I was saved, way back in the day, surfing was my religion. If I had anxiety, I would go surfing, and I'd get out of the water, and, and I know what the peace of God feels like, and that's what I felt like when I had a session. It was really a religious experience to me, and all of a sudden, something raised itself up in my thoughts saying, you're going to get eaten alive, right? <laughs> or you're just going to get your leg chomped off and bleed to death before you get to the lifeguard. And every little thing that rubs up again. And so the movie created an emotion that put a thought into my long-term memory. And it haunted me, even though statistically the odds of getting attacked and killed by a shark. Well, I, I read it this way on the Internet. It's, more, it's 38 times more likely that you will get struck by lightning and killed than eaten by a shark. Now, if you have something that's been inserted into your emotional brain through imagery and emotion and visuals and sensation, all the statistics in the world cannot dig that out. You need to be transformed by the renewing of your mind in this kind of way. The only thing that can dig things out of your emotional brain, information can't dig it out, statistics can't get it out, the only thing that can dig it out is the anointing of God. The God encounter, even if it's just a, a, a revelation, a rhema revelation, knowledge from the word of God in your time in the word. Anybody ever read the word and something came up out of the word that just shook you and you knew that there was a, a, a touch of encounter to it? It was not just another idea or another concept. It was a download from heaven, and you knew it. And after that, you saw things differently, and it didn't matter what happened when you were a child anymore. That revelation usurped the strength of that old experience that happened when you were a child. And all of a sudden, you're seeing things the way they really are and not the, way, not the picture that the devil painted. I had a friend talk me when I was a young kid into going seeing The Exorcist on the big screen. Okay, can I tell you that even after I got saved, I was a little bit intimidated by the enemy because in that movie, they make men of God so impotent in the face of the devil that the only way you can get the devil to come out of a girl is to say, come in and jump out the window and kill yourself. I'm like, really? That's the God that I'm being invited to be a part of? Absolutely not. But that's the picture the enemy wants to paint through film. He'll be very careful about the movies that you go see. Because it, you can say, oh, it doesn't affect me. But it, it affects you down here in ways that you don't even know. That's why I like going seeing movies where there's victory in them. Then I can identify with those victories. Since God does not, well, let me back up. Accurate insight into the true nature of things should bring peace and confidence. When God gives you revelation about things that have been tormenting you and you see it the way he sees it, all of a sudden the pressure's gone, or it should be. Since God does not live within the confines of time, when he believe, what we believe in Jesus, excuse me, since God does not live within the confines of time, when we believe in Jesus unto salvation, he sees us already as the finished product. He sees the end from the beginning. So here you are. You just came to Jesus. You're, you're still addicted to drugs, but at least you gave your life to Jesus, right? You've got five different addictions. You hate everybody. You hate yourself especially. And then God shows up and said, you're my champion. And you're like, What? I hate myself. I can't see myself that way. I, said, I know, but I'm going to go to work on you. And you're, someday you're going to see yourself the way I already see you. And that becomes very exciting as a prospect. Now, I'm going to read something to you, but I please. I, I'm only reading it because I believe it will help you. I'm not puffing up. I don't want to say, ah, look at me or anything like that. It's not what it's about. But in my worst emotional state as a brand new believer, I despised myself, right? Because I had one rejection scenario after another. So now I get saved and, 
and I think I might have alluded to the story, but I'm going to read it to you. I had a gun that I was fascinated with, and the devil was talking to me all the time, man, just, you, you suck, just go ahead and finish it, right? And, but I also felt the Lord over here saying, you need to get rid of that thing, that thing's dark. And uh, so I sold it, took a beating on it financially, I took the money, and I sent it to Kenneth Copeland. And I thought, it's done. I get a letter back from Kenneth Copeland. Now, I was partnered with him for 20 years. And for 20 years, all I got was the voice of Victory Magazine and a little bit of monthly letter and that, and that was cool. I was good with that. He had hundreds, hundreds of thousands of partners, right? How's he going to write a personal letter? I got a personal letter. He said, Dear Timothy, what I intended to do when I sat down to write you this letter was simply to thank you for the generous gift of 175 that I recently received from you. And though I still do want to express my gratitude for your gift, the Lord impressed on me an even more important message for you. My friend, in the eyes of the Lord, you are very highly esteemed. The gifts, the prayers, the loves you've shared with others have come before the Lord as a fragrant offering. Because of the faith that inspires them, you are well known in his kingdom. And as the angel once told Daniel the prophet, you are highly esteemed. Pray with confidence about the needs you're facing and ask God to fulfill the longing in your heart. For since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And the answers are even now on their way. In the past few weeks, God has reminded you, r reminded me of you many times. And he's pointed out the crucial part you play in the ministry. And he's revealed the incredible tenderness and deep respect he has for you. Now, when I read that, I thought, this went to the wrong person. <laughs> this cannot be me. I know me, and this is not. How can the God of the universe look at all my baggage and have anything that even remotely looks like respect for me? But remember, God sees the end from the beginning. He's not trapped in time with us. He doesn't look at my season and go, ooh, ooh, oh, my God, I'll see you down here. Ooh. <laughs> no, he's like, I know where you're going. I know where, because he sees the end of it. And down there, he's going to, He's waiting for me to say, well done, good and faithful servant, right? But I don't see it yet. But the way that we are transformed by the renewing of our mind is we have to start seeing ourselves the way God already sees us, right? And that's why we spend time with him in prayer. You'll hear things from God, and you won't believe they're from God because you know you're a knucklehead, but he's just saying, I'm so pleased with you, right? And it breaks all the junk. It destroys all the mind monsters, and it causes you to stay in your biosphere and not come out and to laugh at the brontosaurus through the glass. All right? All right. Pastor Anthony. Awesome. The mind monsters. You know, we're, we're, uh, we're going to be talking about this for, you know, another, another week or so, and um, we're talking about, obviously, we're... The transformation uh, that comes from renewing your mind, right? And, and, and the change that takes place from investing in changing first what's up here. And so I, I believe that it's important that as we talk about transforming by changing something that you can't see physically, something that you can't touch physically. I mean, I, we're, we're talking about transforming our mind so there's nothing tangible to hold on to that you're investing into. It's something you can't see. It's something you can't feel. And so we're, we're talking about transforming ourselves. And, and, and I, I think it's important that we, we understand that what is it that transformation is supposed to look like naturally when you're investing in something you can't see physically? What, what is the transformation supposed to look like? How do you measure when something has actually been transformed? How do you measure when something has actually been done up here? That there's some action. And transformation, you're, when, you're, when you're talking about being transformed, you're talking about something, you're establishing thorough or dramatic change, whether it's a physical form, whether it's like the look of something, the appearance, whether it's the character, right? So your behavior, the way you, you carry yourself, your demeanor, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you even uh, speak, that is a clear representation of what's happening up here. Right? And the Bible tells us that so as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Right? So as he, as he forms thoughts, as he forms uh, conceptions about things, 
that that is what you're going to use to measure what transformation looks like. But when we're measuring that, and then we're putting examples side by side of, oh, this is what transformation looks like. You can tell this person put a lot of work into their marriage. You can tell, you can tell this person really, really worked hard at, at changing, really worked hard at that. When you're talking about transformation, you're, you're, you're actually now introducing a different element. You're introducing faith into the picture. And, and what you're doing is you're taking the principles of what faith is, and you're using that to bring about a change that you could never imagine doing on your own strength. Faith puts a demand on God to do something that's impossible for you naturally. And so transformation shouldn't be something that's possible naturally. It should be something that's done by putting a demand on what you can't see. And so I want us to look at these principles that, that it's in Hebrews 11. And, and we probably have all read this and we probably have all heard it. But faith... There's two principles of faith. There's two ways of looking at faith. There's two, way, two actions of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, right? So, so faith is the promise of transformation. Faith promises, hey, there's something that's about to happen. It, it, it's going to be good or, hey, there's something about to happen. It's not going to be great. It, it promises transformation, right? It's the assurance. It, it's assuring you things are going to happen. Things are coming. Then there's the conviction of things not seen. In other words, faith is also the realization that what you're currently going through is real. Where you're at as a person, that's who you really are. And isn't it funny that sometimes it takes a friend, someone close to you, a coworker, it takes someone else other than yourself for whatever reason, they're able to see changes in you before you ever think of them. They're able to look at you. They're able to size you up. And in your mind, we're, we're the ones that constantly battle with, man, am I progressing? Am I falling back? Am I getting a little lazy? Am I getting too excited? And we're going back and forth. We don't know where we're going. We're constantly questioning ourselves. Are we growing spiritually? Am I, am I backsliding? Am I, am I getting mature as a responsible adult? Am I becoming more immature as I get older? What's happening? What's happening? But yet it takes other people to identify what the truth is. They're able to then bring realization to where you are, some truth to where you stand. And before we can even entertain the thought of transformation, we have to, one, be able to create substance to what we want transformation to look like. And then, two, have a realization of where you're at really right now. Because until you know where you're at right now, that transformation of where you want to be won't happen. You're going to be aiming for, you're going to be aiming for something that is just an imagination. It's just this fantasy of what you want to see take place. In James, he, he, he tells us that faith by itself is dead if it does not have works, right? There's so also faith by itself, it doesn't, if it does not have works, is dead. So in other words, if, if we're calling, if we're using faith to measure where we're going, we can't just let it be something that's just, hey, I believe I'm going to change. Hey, I believe I'm going to be transformed. Hey, I believe I want to be this person that I'm not there quite yet. But we have to use faith as an action as well. So faith isn't only an identifier. Faith puts that identification into motion. And so, example, if, if you're the kind of person that you, you are constantly in fear of making decisions, right? You're constantly in fear of, uh, of, of saying something that might offend someone. Or you're constantly in fear of, of making a, a family decision that's going to put your family into a direction that maybe you're not sure if it's where you need to be. Or you're just living constantly in a life of fear. What faith does is it identifies, hey, you need to get out of this place of living my fear, and there is a life for you that you can live free from fear. But it also says, but you have to realize that you have to start now making your decisions. So faith identifies where you want to go, and it shows you what you need to do to go. Because when we're talking about transformation, we're not just talking about for the benefit of you. Transformation is going to affect everyone around you. In fact, transformation is going to affect them before it even makes a difference in you. Because as people watch you, who are they watching? They're not watching you live a life 
on your own. They're not living, watching you just be a great family man or, or a great mom. Or they're not watching you be a great husband. They're watching you represent the kingdom of God. And your transformation is going to determine what does something we can't see look like based on the investment you put into something you can't see. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make judgment because that's who I am as a human based on what I see in your life, depending on what you put in something you can't see. And in order for us to measure that, it takes faith. Jesus said he, he gives us a measure of faith. So everyone has a tool to measure their transformation. The moment you said yes to Jesus, you were given an amount of faith to use to bring about transformation in your life. That tells me, and that should tell us, that Jesus expects transformation. He's not questioning, can you be transformed? He's not asking, do you think it's possible that you could change a little? He's not, he's not suggesting, I think it would be nice and it would look good on you for a little change. No, he's expecting because he's given us a tool to measure transformation with. And though to some it may look different than the next person, the truth is it's your responsibility to do something with it. It's our responsibility to transform this thing we call our mind, this thing that makes up a portion of our soul. It's our responsibility to do something with it. Not just hope for something to be done. Not just wish for something to be done. Not just draw on a vision board what you would like to see done. Not just ask the person next to you, what do you think I can become? What do you think should happen? But actually do something that's going to initiate and be proactive with transformation in your life. And so as we, as we use faith to identify transformation, we have to be proactive. You have to be proactive. See, Paul... Paul was talking to the Ephesian church, right? And he was talking to them uh, about what the old man looks like and what the new man should look like. So he was, he, was, I, he was giving them realization of, hey, this is who you guys look like right now. Let me tell you, this is who you look like before Christ, and this is how you're kind of looking like right now. And then he, he brought hope to, but this is who you can become. And so he introduced this idea of, hey, have faith. You can transform too. And, and this is what he says. He says, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in their futility of their minds. In other words, stop behaving as though this mind you have is useless. Stop acting and being and, and, and really entertaining everyone as though you can't think for yourself. You can't act for yourself. You have no idea what needs to change because that's what the Gentiles did. That's what people who don't know Christ do. They walk aimlessly. They walk blind. They walk not knowing. They walk in ignorance. And yet you're acting like as though you know, have no idea what Jesus expects of you. And so he's saying, don't stop walking as though the Gentiles do in their futility of their minds, in the uselessness of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice of every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. When Jesus said, uh, when he said, hey, I give you a measure of faith, he gave you a way to measure what living a life in Christ looks like. And he says that assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self. He doesn't ask you to have someone change you. Can you take off this old self for me? Can you come and point out that thing that's, 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 that's crusty and dirty and old on my back and just take it off? No, he's saying you need to put off your old self. At some point... What he's saying is grow up and make a decision. You're either going to behave as though you don't know what to do or you're going to do something about it and step out of this, this life that is not yours. When, 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 when the Ephesians were taught and explained on what to live like, Paul is basically saying you have a measure, do something with it. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He then goes on to say, 
to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to then put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So, so what am I saying by, by all of this? Everyone wants transformation. At some point in your life, things get boring, things get old, you want something new, you want something different, you want some kind of change, you want some excitement, you want some, some energy to, to pursue a new career, you, want, you, want the, you have the desire to, to go on a new vacation destination you've never been on, you have a desire to have new friends. Transformation is coveted by so many people. But we never hold a measure of what it looks like to be transformed that represents Jesus. Because transformation ultimately is going to represent who God is in you. And if our focus is divided between, well, how does transformation look like and benefits to me? Or how does transformation look like so it makes me look better? You're then... All you're doing is putting the belief part of faith into motion. You're not putting any action of the faith part into motion. And what Jesus is saying, hey, I've given you a measure of faith. And transformation will only come when you use that measure of faith to renew your mind. The only way you're going to be able to establish where your mind is at is by spending time in his word. Is by getting to know Jesus on a level that you've never known before. Is by taking the time to actually listen to what he's saying to you through his word. And by taking the time to read not only what's pleasant and, and tickles you, but actually addresses those areas that haven't been transformed because you've ignored it. And that is what faith in the action does in terms of measuring what transformation looks like in your life faith wasn't given to us to be some cute cliche christian word faith breaks sweat in your life it, it, it breaks sweat it, it 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 brings challenges into reality that you have to work out but as you work out you, you then experience the most beautiful transformation, the most beautiful results, the most beautiful experiences. You then are able to walk free from fear because you realize, hey, I'm going to make a decision today to trust again what God says about me. You then begin to trust and believe in the relationships and, hey, I can actually have a friend I can trust again because you have made the decision. I'm going to love God as he has loved me and I'm going to love this person as God has loved them. And as you make these decisions, you're breaking out of this mold and you're allowing yourself to be transformed because you have invested in the mind that you can't see. And Jesus is saying, if I can just get that kind of transformation within you, I can get that much more transformation in this world. But it's going to start with, what can I do with this measure of faith that God has given me? What can I do with what I know of who Jesus is to me? And if you don't know who Jesus is to you, this is the perfect time to say, Lord, let's get a little closer. I need some things to change. But before I can have things change in my life, I need to know what that looks like. I need to know why transformation is so important to you. I need to know why renewing my mind matters. Why, why is it hurtful to carry on as a believer in Christ and have the same thoughts as someone who doesn't know him? Why is it important to know how to love someone who's betrayed you in order to have a life of freedom? That's what the transformation Jesus is talking about. That's it. It's not I'm tired of my haircut, so let's change that. I'm tired of these shoes, got to get some new ones. This car is getting a little crusty. Time for a detail. That, that's your transformation. What he's talking about is transformation that's going to change the world. And it starts with your character. 
And it starts with putting into action what you believe about who God says he is and who he says you are. It's not easy. It's dangerous. Because now you're exposing a part of yourself that has never been exposed before. You're being vulnerable to people that maybe you, you've never been vulnerable with before. And you're allowing yourself to be molded into a new figure, a new shape, a new identity that you've never walked in before. You're going to walk away that says that, that has a, a sense of confidence that you've never had before. You're going to talk in such assurance that you've never talked like before. And all of that is to represent a God who people have never seen. That's what transformation looks like by the measure of your faith. And that's why it's important that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. In order to defeat these mind monsters that constantly attack, that constantly destroy, that constantly try to uh, suffocate your thought life. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind and use the measure of faith that Jesus entrusted to you.